Philosophy Battle, the most entertaining presentation of philosophy you'll ever find on the internet, probably. Now entering the battlefield of metaphysics. Science. There are many with great love and passion for it, and many who feel threatened by it. Doing science, though, is markedly different from speaking about science. Defending it or attacking it is not a matter of doing science, it is a matter of philosophy, and there are many enemies on the battlefield of the philosophy of science. There is no philosophic battlefield superior in its proximity to the public's understanding of how such issues impact the function of our society than the battlefield of the philosophy of science, philosophy. I have just left this battlefield. As you can see, I'm in a sort of portal that I'm taking to the battlefield of metaphysics. I did this because there were enemies on the battlefield of philosophy wielding metaphysical weapons much greater than they are capable of handling. I will certainly return to the battlefield of the philosophy of science once I have shown you how to dismantle the powers of this weapon called relativism. But for now I am offering quite a treat. I will provide for you a map of the battlefield. If you are new to philosophy, this video may help you greatly to gain a larger perspective of the war. Here are some shortcuts to the presentation for your consideration if you are familiar or if you are only interested in particular parts of philosophy. Here we go. Whoop. We'll start here. This is usually the first port of entry to the battlefield of philosophy for those unfamiliar to philosophic battle, and they typically arrive when they begin to ask what even is science? What's so different about science versus non-science, and can we tell the difference? Enter demarcation. I would like to take this time early to tell you that I sympathize with the difficulty in trying to figure out where to even start when it comes to doing philosophy. Let me advise you that when it comes to philosophy of science in particular, an excellent place to start, wherever possible that is, is with the positivists. I should indeed one day devote an episode to them specifically and their downfall, for the obliterated positivists were once masters of this philosophic promised land. Now their philosophic blood and organs spilled and littered across the battlefield from their demise has seeped and soaked into the battleground, thus seemingly on occasion possessing warriors who step onto the battlefield to this day, capturing them into sharing their positivist sentiments without the warrior even being cognizant of the influence that the remnants of positivism continue to have on the battlefield. Indeed, even warriors that take positivists to be their ideal enemy are influenced. It was the positivists after all, such as A.J. Ayer, who demarcated the scientific from the non-scientific in a way we are often told to in our public school upbringing or popular media that claim statements are scientific if they can be verified through empirical observation and further only claims that can be verified through empirical observation are cognitively meaningful. Theirs is the verifiable theory of meaning. Rendering statements about concepts that cannot be empirically verified, such as ghosts, spirits, afterlife concepts, chakras, chi, etc. as non-scientific and lacking cognitive meaning. However, verifiability was not good enough. As Sir Karl Popper shows us, clear cases of non-science such as astrology that can be considered verifiable and in fact verified according to astrologists. Karl Popper instead uses his falsification to show how we can demarcate between scientific and non-scientific theories such as astrology versus astronomy. Falsification is the criteria that a theory must be falsifiable if it is to be considered scientific. The idea is that if a theory can explain away any possible observation, seemingly counting all observation or all possible observations as verification instead, then it is not science. That lacking the ability to be proven false by observation therefore conveys that one's theory is indifferent to how the world actually is, the world as we sense it. Scientific theory forbids certain observations. In fact, the more it forbids, the stronger it is. Theories become falsified by displaying that which it supposedly forbids. 
Hopper uses this to demarcate from other seemingly verifiable theories that are still non-scientific as they lack falsification. Social psychoanalytic theories like Marxism, Freudian and Adlerian psychoanalytics. I have carefully and lovingly prepared for you a short video elucidating Popper's position in his own words. Please review this wonderfully exciting battle. But falsification won't do either. Philosophically, the result of a single experiment cannot actually falsify a theory because there are a number of background assumptions, other theories, and if we show a result opposite of what we were predicting, it may be any one or any number of those other variables. I'll note that this is called underdetermination, championed by Pierre Duhem in physics, and extended by Willard von Orman Quine. W. V. O. Quine extends the issue to all of knowledge, so this is called by many the Duhem Quine thesis. But I personally am not much in the habit to always employ that term as yet. Rather, when I speak in philosophy in particular, I tend to cite Duhem, and when I speak of epistemology or knowledge in general, then I might employ the term Duhem Quine. But that's a personal preference. The philosophic issue is still there, and there are variations of underdetermination. Two that show up in this map will be firstly holism or a holistic version of underdetermination and a contrastative version, both with the variations thinking of them as temporary issues or as permanent issues. This is one kind in particular that I outline is called the holistic variety, and it is the one that is taken as a problem for falsification. Things are not clean. Particular theory to result is never so isolated and direct for us to know for sure that if something the theory forbids does not happen to show up, that it was the theory's fault. There are a number of background assumptions, and it could be any one of them as a perfectly good candidate to blame for why we didn't get the result we predicted. The idea of a connection of a specific theory to a specific result being so clean and direct in modern philosophic warfare may be as much of a fantasy as the positivists' contention about the direct observation of facts without the filter of a theory to interpret the facts, which Popper himself isn't down with. In any case, we will come across underdetermination again in this battlefield of the other variety, and I will explain it then, I can promise you this. But wherever it may be, wherever relevant factors are to be considered and possibly solved by induction, but we will see that that is problematic as well, can tie us into the battlefield of epistemology. Thus a portal to the battlefield like the one I am in right now can be found nearby. Though I am in a portal heading towards metaphysics, this portal connects to epistemology, from which some demonic aura is seeping onto the battlefield. Anyway, I think other larger issues that have a warrior turn away from falsification as a weapon certainly as Popper wielded it, come about not from problems of philosophy, but from problems of historical accuracy and how scientists actually behave. Popper knew of the importance of looking at what history of science actually was, and how scientific life actually goes about. So enters Thomas Kuhn, with some strong counterpoints. Firstly, scientists actually don't falsify a theory when they are wrong when the predicted result fails, and in fact, coming up with some other reasons for that failure rather than falsifying the theory can be beneficial. Neptune anyone? For those of you who don't know, the origins of the theory of an additional planet, thus Neptune's discovery, came by explaining away the failure of predicting Uranus's position using a Newtonian model. Secondly, against using falsification as demarcation, non-sciences like astrology, and as we have seen in episode 1, creationists, do actually make claims that are falsifiable. The question is, when they fail in their prediction, do they just make an excuse so neither themselves nor the theory takes blame? Or do they treat it as a puzzle to be solved? Do they go on to solve the puzzle of why they failed? Puzzle solving is what demarcates between science and non-science. But that only applies within a specific scientific paradigm, which itself is not ever in question unless we are in a state of crisis. 
and in that state we may switch over to another paradigm. I have lovingly created a presentation for you detailing what Kuhn himself says when comparing his views with Popper's. Please enjoy and review. So to offer a quick recap if you've gotten lost, we first tend to think of theories or concepts as being scientific if they are verifiable empirically, that is they are verifiable by our senses, what we see, hear, or touch, etc. But that wasn't good enough, since non-scientific theories are considered verified by their advocates, and not just things like Marxist theory or Freudian psychoanalysis, but things that are clearly not scientific, like astrology. Think about people who believe in astrology and seem to think that seeing so many outgoing leaders being Leos somehow shows that astrology is true. So instead we then move on to thinking that theories are scientific if they are falsifiable. Not that they are proven false, but that they can be proven false empirically, again by what we see, hear, or touch, etc. And I guess in this case for the astrologists, if we show them a shy, timid Leo, then that should prove them false. But would they give up their belief in astrology? Not usually. They'll always find a way to show how they must be actually right. If it can't be proven wrong no matter what we see, then it's not science. There were some important problems with this though, one being under determination, which shows no experiment is directly linked to a single theory, so we couldn't say an experiment can falsify any specific particular theory that we had in mind while we were testing at the time. But perhaps more importantly is that scientists don't actually falsify a general theory when what they predict doesn't actually end up being the outcome. Instead they often blame themselves, saying that they must have done some experiment wrong and try again. That is that they try to solve the puzzle of why they predicted wrongly. And also non-scientific theories can make predictions that turn out to be not true, which should falsify them, but they just go on doing the same practice, not even trying to solve the problem of why they were wrong, believing the same theory, putting the blame on things other than themselves or the general theory, not really changing. Think about how that astrologist might say you'll never find a Leo that's not a leader or shy, and then if we do find a Leo that is shy and not a leader, they'll just make up excuses about variables and don't actually change what they believe or admit that they must have done something wrong or messed up in their practice. So a practice is considered scientific if the practitioners are puzzle solving. And while blaming the theory isn't done initially, a gross accumulation of failures to solve puzzles, that is a great number of unsolved puzzles, can induce a crisis in the community of expert practitioners to start blaming the theory, which may lead them to disavow the general theory that they once had allegiance to in favor of another one. So it's not the failure of any particular experiment that changes our theory, but how our expert community of puzzle solvers feel, possibly prompted by gross failures to solve puzzles, to switch from one theory to another. Dropping Kuhn's name in battle can then be done often as a mean to deflect falsification out of the hands of our enemies, but the resulting outcome of what that entails is not what Kuhn ever intended. You see, according to Kuhn, on the one side, these paradigms are incommensurable. There is no super paradigm from which to judge others. Each judges itself from its own standards. On the other side, experiments are theory laden. Kuhn credits and R. Hansen to show how observations are not objective because they are endowed with the theory used to interpret them. Using what I think is an easily understandable scientific example, imagine how we observe the sun moving across the sky. Two might observe the same thing and cite the same evidence supporting different theories. In this case, seeing the sun move across the sky can be cited to show that the sun revolves around the earth and the earth is unmoving. Or it can also be the sun is unmoving and the earth is simply rotating. In the two different paradigms, called them Tycho and Kepler, the same observation, what it is, what it means, and what it counts as evidence for is influenced by the paradigm which is used to interpret it. Because of these two issues, the incommensurability issue and the theory laden issue, the area between paradigms, let us say, is insecure. There isn't a clear rational structure bridging the gap between paradigms, certainly not another super scientific paradigm, let us say. It is indeed insecure. 
This insecurity is utilized as a point of attack, a place from which is summoned what I refer to as the gates of hell. I have prepared a small presentation detailing their creation here, but before saying more about these gates, I would love to note that reactions to Kuhn has resulted in many great battles. One of the most notable is Lakatosh vs Feraband, as there appears to be a sort of rational gap between paradigms and yet also a kind of dogmatism to the theory once we are within a specific paradigm, Feraband reacts to the battle of Kuhn vs Popper as a victory for anti-science, and the inability to demarcate science itself even from being another dogmatic religion. Imra Lakatosh resurrects falsification, fitting it into a new Kuhnian system calling it sophisticated falsification, for which we can indeed judge one paradigm as superior to another, given one might have novel predictions that could not be made by the other. In this way, a theory can be replaced by a better one, even if it isn't falsified as Popper may have suggested. But we'll speak of Lakatos later, since I've obviously gone into the work of creating that clearly compelling animation. One might say Kunian influence through Fairbend would confront Popperian influence through Lakatosh. The confrontation though may have been one of philosophy's most exciting battles that never actually was. Like fighters in promos before the big fight, they were hyping each other up before their scheduled confrontation. But unfortunately, Lakatosh's life had expired before we could pay witness to its epicness. The gates themselves, however, are addressed as such because they became an access point for those to enter onto the battlefield of the philosophy of science for those who wish to challenge objectivity, rationality, and the role of nature and reality in science, perhaps much as an influence of Fairbend himself. But it is a gate here, not from another battlefield of philosophy like a portal, but from a completely different field of study, namely sociology. Enter the SSK. Though I didn't mention it much, and focus mostly on Kuhn as their access, underdetermination of theory by fact, which is that other kind of underdetermination called contrastative above, is an additional power source for these gates, of which I will discuss that kind of underdetermination when we get to justification later. It might become clearer as I go further that each area in philosophy of science and also other battlefields affect each other. Battles won or lost can have repercussions throughout the philosophic land and indeed from other philosophic planes. Many are led instead to a different port however, by questions of how does science prove things? How is science, unlike other methods, justified in what they say about the world beyond what we normally observe? I find that even though many often first arrive here, they end up best attracted to demarcation to find the difference between science versus non-science, not truly a sincere look at how science is able to have justification in its claims about the world in a way different from others. However, they are welcome to the area of justification. It is true that in commonplace one may say science has proven something, but the truth is it does not prove things in the way that logic does or math. 